Hey, welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. You can find this full video version of this podcast on YouTube, or you can find the audio only version across major podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, you name it, wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Today, it's just going to be a solo episode. It's just going to be myself. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions, you know, asking how I've gotten media credentialed, um, how I started my YouTube channel, just more about who I am. So I thought it might be helpful to just do a podcast where I talk about my background, who I am, how I got to where I am today, um, how I started my channel and, and got media credentialed, all these different things. So um, next next week, I'm really excited because I'm going to be having on Tom Lampkin, who is a ex-big leaguer for 13 years. And he actually was on the Seattle Mariners from 1999 through 2001. Really excited to, to talk to him and hear his story, especially you know that 2001 series where the Mariners won 116 games. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, feel free to comment any additional questions that you have after the fact, any comments, and would be happy to answer those for you. So a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Southern California. We moved up to Southwest Washington back in 2000 when I was in like kindergarten. So essentially my entire life, I've lived in Washington State. I uh, am the middle child. I have two brothers, always been very competitive, as you might imagine, uh, my older brother is now a firefighter locally, and then my younger brother actually works for Dave Ramsey Solutions. Um, he's in marketing over there, actually in Tennessee, so kind of cool, pretty diverse what we do. I myself am a mortgage lender. I've been in mortgage lending for seven years. I'll get into that part in, in a bit, but growing up, um, I've always been pretty creative, you could say. My family sometimes referred to me as Hollywood growing up because I was you could say trying to be a comedian type thing, uh, trying to get the laughs at the dinner table type thing. Um, as I mentioned, I've always been creative growing up. I, I remember, you know, just writing short stories when I was bored or drawing cartoons. I used to be big into the, you know, Sunday newspaper cartoon section, uh, specifically Calvin and Hobbes. I have three giant books of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, they were my favorite cartoon growing up. Just, just always had an active imagination. Um, I actually ended up taking a graphic design class my senior year in high school, and I really enjoyed that. Um, so I thought that I might want to do that as a career. I wasn't sure really what I wanted to do. Separately, I did my senior project in high school on sports science. I worked with the, uh, the kinesiologist um, at our high school and did a little project. He worked at Rebound, so I was thinking maybe I wanted to get into sports medicine to try to stay in sports or go graphic design and be creative, that type of thing. Wasn't really sure what I wanted to do moving into college. I've always been introverted, pretty shy throughout high school. Um, back in high school, I had, you know, my friend group. And then, you know, in sports, I had my friends. But outside of that, it was more so just, you know, playing sports, playing video games with friends, hanging out with friends. I always knew I wanted to go to college. And that was kind of, you know, the path that was given to us growing up. Uh, and that was instilled into us by our parents was that you're going to go to college and get your degree. And, and I think that's a great mindset to have. Um, there's definitely other routes that you can go. You don't have to go to college. If you find a career path that is, you know, able to, to bypass that then great. But I knew that I wanted to go to a four year university and, uh, I guess kind of backing up, I played sports growing up my entire life. I played basketball, football, baseball, soccer, um, you know, all throughout elementary school, um, up through middle school actually. And then, you know, I didn't make the team in basketball my freshman year. So that's where basketball stopped. I kept playing baseball and football throughout high school. Um, I ended up not playing football my senior year just because, just because I felt like I was putting in a ton of work, not getting really the opportunities that I was looking for. And, you know, I've never been the biggest, strongest, fastest guy out there. I've always had to work really hard to, to compete and try to outwork myself during practice. So but ended up playing baseball throughout my entire high school career. I was a uh, outfielder and pitcher throughout my time in high school, and uh, I didn't make the varsity team until my senior year. But when I did make it my senior year, I was the the closer for our baseball team, which was a, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, the high pressure situations at the end of the game, going in and closing it out against against solid teams. That was a lot of fun. I was a two pitch pitcher, just a four seam fastball and a twelve six curveball, but. Um, you know, I feel like if I really put myself out there and I tried to go play at a community college, I for sure could have. I didn't know the recruiting process whatsoever, and neither did my parents. You know, I just kind of thought that if you're good enough, then scouts will find you. 
well, you know, unless you're pumping mid mid to low 90s in high school, then there's probably not going to be scouts out there looking at you with radar guns type thing. Um, so if I wanted to, I, I should have been sending film in, you know, trying to put myself out there for, for uh, colleges to look at. But um, I had one opportunity at a local community community college, but decided to just go attend a four year university. My older brother actually was going to Washington State University over in Pullman. So I had visited him a few times on, you know, Father's Day, Father's Weekend. And I, I, did, I loved it over there in Pullman. You know, it's six hours away. It's just far enough away from the parents to where, um, you know, they can't just drive over there on a certain day and go see you. That's not the reason why I actually went over there, but but maybe just a small reason. But uh, yeah, I, w- I went over to Washington State University over in Pullman. And actually in high school, I ended up playing with uh, Ian Hamilton, who's now a relief pitcher on the New York Yankees currently. He was a, a year younger than me. He was just one of those guys that was extremely athletic, just a freak athlete. And I, I remember joking, you know, in the outfield, shagging fly balls about the scouts that were out there looking for him and, you know, talking about his signing bonus and all that type of stuff, just having fun. And so it's, it's really cool to see what he's doing right now. Um, a couple of years ago, I flipped on, you know, an MLB game. It, it was the Blue Jays and Twins. And I look over and Ian Hamilton's pitching and I'm just like, oh my gosh. So to see that and the, the success that he's having right now is is really cool. But like I mentioned, I've never been the strongest, fastest guy out there on the team. Um, I've always had to work extremely hard, especially during practices, you know, uh, specifically during, you know, cardio sessions was when I really pushed myself. And that's, I still run, do those types of things. And it's really, uh, really good for the mental mindset, because if you can push yourself beyond where you think your mental boundaries say you should be stopping or if, if you're getting tired and you see a tree, you know, a bit down the road, then you say, I'm not going to stop until I get to that tree. Well, then once you get to that tree, you see the next light post and you're not going to stop until that point. The more you do that, the more you push yourself past those mental boundaries, the easier it's going to be next time, the better off you're going to be long term. And if you could really focus to push yourself past your mental brown boundaries with working out specifically and, and running for myself, then that transfers over to pretty much everything in life with if you're going through a hard time or, you know, if something's hard with work, then you're able to find that next level and push yourself beyond to where you would be able to go. So, and you know, when I say that I had to push myself hard during practices, it's not necessarily that I'm competing against other people, although that does help at times, especially in competition with uh, sports, but you know, it's more so about competing with yourself and, you know, can you push yourself beyond your own boundaries versus being better than someone else? But uh, with that being said, I, I decided to go and attend Washington State University over in Pullman. Uh, I stayed in Parham Hall freshman year. Uh, for all you Cougs out there, if you went to WSU, um, there's it's just a really unique town over there, the setting. It's, it's really built around the college, Pullman, Washington. And it's amazing if you've been there for an extended period of time. But I really had no clue what I wanted to do at that point. But had a blast over in Pullman at Washington State University. Was attending all the football games. Going to the rec center, you know, figuring out, working out after the fact, after sports ended for me. I played an intramural football over there. I played an intramural football over there. I played, you know, basketball in the rec center quite often for cardio. But essentially, I was just taking some of the, some of the low-level classes my freshman, sophomore year of college. Um, in my summers during college, I worked in a steel mill. My uh, dad uh, has been in steel sales ever since he graduated from college. And so uh, myself and my brothers... We worked at different times, but throughout our summers in college, we would work at the steel mill. And it's not quite a steel mill that you might think of. Like if you've seen the movie Rudy, you know, there's like melted steel, like flying in the background type thing. It's it's nothing like that. But uh, the company that he works for, they paint steel. They paint steel for roofing. And so there was a paint line that, you know, the steel would go through on a coil. It would get painted, come off on a coil. And then I would essentially, you know, take it off there, band it, put it on a pallet, put it in a storage type thing. But uh, it was 12 hour shift, swing shift, you know, during the the summer and you're the summer hire. So you're the one that's, you know, doing all of the stuff that the regulars don't want to be doing. Um, And I mean, out there working by yourself when it's 90 degrees, 100 degrees out in the steel mill. And especially while, you know, the rest of your friends are enjoying their summer and you're in there, you know, working 12 hour shift, swing shift, not really enjoying life too much during the summers, um, but incredibly grateful for that opportunity. And, you know, 
blessed to have that experience so that I could, you know, have that as a, as a mental thing for when time, times do get tough, you know, at least I'm not doing the summer hire thing anymore. <laughs> Now, after my sophomore year of college, my uncle gave me a book called The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. And I read this book when I was, you know, taking breaks uh, between, you know, steel coils in the steel mill in the paint shack out there. And that's how I started to learn about investing in real estate and passive income and entrepreneurship, you could say. And, you know, because I learned through that, through that experience out in the steel mill that I didn't want to really work for an hourly rate or have someone tell me what I'm worth, you know, how many hours I need to be somewhere in order to make a certain amount of money. And so th through the, through reading that book, I started to learn about passive income, uh, specifically investing in real estate. Passive income can mean a lot of different things. You can get it a lot of different ways, but passive income essentially means that you're making money even when you're not actively working on something. So, you know, if you own, own multiple properties in real estate, you're collecting those checks every month. You're not necessarily having to go and physically work for that money. So, and simultaneously, you know, I had, I had heard growing up to, you know, be conservative, save your money, work until you're 65 or 70, and then you retire. And I just, I've always wanted to push myself to try to be able to get to a spot to where I could, to push myself to get to a spot to where I could technically, you know, retire early. I don't know when exactly my goal is, is 40, but, uh, you know, I, I probably never would retire. It's just a matter of, it's not necessarily the ability to be able to retire, but the ability to be able to kind of do what you want when you want to have that financial freedom to be able to do what you want to. And so, um, essentially through reading that book, you know, after my sophomore year of college is when I decided to major in finance. So I just decided that I want to major in finance, learn about how money works so that I could then you know, just be that better off down the road on my goal of, you know, being financially free at some point uh, sooner rather than, rather than later. I will say that, you know, you go to college, you don't learn as much in college as you, as you might think. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, like college is more so about learning who you are as a person and, and growing into yourself and, and growing up, at least it was for me. Um, you know, 75%, I would say, of these information that I know now is from things that I've learned, you know, hands-on in the real world with real world application as far as real estate, mortgage lending, um, finance, and then continuing education on your own. So, I mean, sure, you know, you go to college, you read your books, you do your thing, you're going to learn a good amount of information. How much of that will you retain? I'm not quite sure, but it's really up to you even after college to continually be learning new things and continue educating yourself on areas that you want to learn about. And that's a majority of, and then also the, the real, real world experience, whatever field you're in, you know, that will help you more so than any college degree could help you. So I decided to major in finance. Um, after my junior year of college, I went to one of those, you know, job fairs at Washington State University. I ended up meeting a uh, financial advising firm so I ended up getting connected and doing a financial advising internship with a certain company after my junior year of college. Uh, we had to create a list of you know 300 people that we knew and started calling them, cold calling them to set up financial appointments. And then also it was like, you know, calling all the people that you know, all the people that your parents know, your friends know, you know, just digging deep and, and, and finding your sphere of people. And, you know, like I mentioned, I was super shy in high school. And this really broke me out of my shell completely, you know, having to cold call people and have conversations that it was very uncomfortable at first. Um, then, I, I mean, that's also part of it is getting beyond the fear of rejection. Once you get rejected a certain amount of times, then it you, you kind of get numb to it. And then beyond a certain point, you're not really afraid to hear the word no. Um, you know, it's like you might hear in any, any sales position, but try to seek out the no because the more no's that you get, you're that much closer to a yes, which is cliche, but I mean, it does have some truth to it. But so, I mean, that inter internship really got me out of my shell, um, you know, socially at, at least. Uh, I knew that I didn't want to do financial advising after that, you could say. But um, after that point, I wasn't really afraid to walk up and talk to people. So my senior year of college, you know, broke out of my shell, was able to to be comfortable with kind of who I am and, and uh, really 
talk to whoever and just have a conversation with people. I also started getting really into fitness after my sophomore and junior year of college. You know, throughout sports in high school, you go through different workout programs and that's really all you know. But then as I mentioned with continuing education, you know, it's one of those things with fitness, um, you know, throughout college, I was doing different workout programs. I was doing like the, the Christian Bale Batman program, like how, what he worked out or the workout that he did to get ready for Batman begins, that type of thing. Um, but then I started to get onto YouTube more so after my junior sophomore, junior year of high, uh, college, I started following guys like Steve cook, you know, Jim shark, uh, the clothing brand, Mark Lobliner with tigerfitness.com, uh, Christian Guzman with Alpha Lead Athletics, you know, Max Tuning, Kino Body, all these different people, just people that, you know, kind of looked how I wanted to look essentially. I started to really get more focused into bodybuilding since, you know, I wasn't really playing any sports aside from flag football. So there weren't any, so there weren't really any strains on my body that I had to worry about, you know, with baseball, you have to worry about the shoulder and keeping the arm healthy, especially with pitching. And that's the most important thing versus, you know, trying to do incline dumbbell press, you know, you're not doing that in baseball most likely because you're trying to keep that shoulder healthy. So I got really committed into fitness at that point. And also, you know, through these, these people that I was following with, uh, spe specifically Christian Guzman and, uh, Alpha Lead Athletics, it was really cool to be able to see him create a brand from scratch and go from, you know, him just in his garage by himself with a small little setup, just printing shirts by himself to now he's got massive facilities down in Texas. If, if you do follow Christian Guzman, Alpha Lead Athletics, he's got, I, I don't know what the company does, but it does like hundreds of millions of dollars a year type thing in, in fitness clothing sales. So that was, so that was definitely an inspiration for me moving forward and kind of speaking to that entrepreneurial type mindset that I, that I had found. I remember my senior year in college, my, my go-to meals was like popcorn chicken or really just any kind of chicken bag chicken from uh, Walmart and then just eating pasta with chicken. I felt like I was kind of like a fine tuned machine at that point. And you know, they say that pasta isn't the best thing for you, but I, I feel like when I'm eating pasta and like lean meat, like shrimp or chicken, that that's the kind of the best route for me, but I digress. And if you also went to Pullman, then you knew that there was the, uh, occasional Domino's pizza mixed into there in Pullman, you know, late nights in Pullman, order Domino's late night and have it show up to your door. But I uh, graduated from Washington State University in 2016. It took me four years to major in finance. And then I also got a, a second major in, in marketing. Uh, it was a new thing at Washington State to where you could double major. So I ended up basically going to, to mainly just finance and marketing classes my junior and senior year. So got a double major there. But even after graduation, I still had no clue what I wanted to really do. I knew that I wanted to be somewhere in finance. You know, I applied to finance at Nike was my dream job at that time. I guess just finance for really any athletic company or big company that I could see myself working for was my dream job at the time. So just sent out resumes to a lot of people, but I had a foot in the door at a local mortgage company down here in South Southwest Washington. A family friend was working at a, a mortgage company and so I reached out to them, did an interview, and my buddy and I did a trip down to the Bay Area to visit my uncle. We saw the Golden State Warriors play the Oklahoma City Thunder in the playoffs that year, 2016. And on my way down there is when I actually accepted my first job out of, out of college. I would be uh, working for a loan officer. So a loan officer is essentially someone that goes out and brings in business. They look for people that are looking to buy, sell, or refinance a home. We essentially, as loan officers, you know, help people figure out their mortgage financing needs. Uh, we get them pre-approved, so we take a look at their income, their credit situation, the amount of assets that, that they have or money in their bank account for down payment, closing costs, those different items. And then we figure out, depending on you know, how much they qualify for, compared to where they want their monthly payment to be in total and how much they have for down payment, all those items and figure out which sales price range they want to buy in. But so I was working for a loan officer at the time and, you know, I had no experience, no idea about mortgages really at all. Um, so my first job was just kind of reviewing income documents for clients, just uh, W-2s, pay stubs, tax returns, that type of thing. And I took the job in mortgages because I knew at, at least long term, it would help me with my goal of wanting to invest in real estate long term because, you know, uh, knowing mortgages is a pretty crucial piece in the real estate picture. So if I could learn about mortgages, the behind the scenes on that, 
and that'll help me with my passive income and investing in real estate long term. At the same time, you know, I had my newfound passion in in fitness and I had learned a lot about intermittent fasting. And that's actually what I was doing throughout my senior year specifically that I found a ton of success with was, you know, essentially eating all of your calories within a, a six or eight hour window. And then for the other 16 or 18 hours, you'd be fasting. And basically some people think, and some studies show that your body is able to produce more hormones, or at the very least it helps your body just process the old food more efficiently. And I found that I was able to reduce body fat that way. And that really helps for me. So um, my buddy graduated at the same time as me from Washington State University. He was in computer science. So him and I decided to start a a uh, company together, a fitness brand called FastFit, which is essentially combining intermittent fasting and fitness. Our goal was to uh, design an app to where you'd be able to track your intermittent fasting window. It would tell you when you're able to eat, that type of thing, track your calories, your workout routine, eventually personal training and all that. Um, but eventually we ran out of resources and time and money and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, before that, we went full steam ahead on creating the brand. I designed a logo and create, did some creative stuff with that. We would have, you know, nightly meetings talking about what, what the next steps were. I created an LLC through the state of Washington. My buddy was thinking up how to actually create the app since he was in computer science. You know, I, I had experience of going through Alibaba, which is a company in China, uh, which is where a lot of, a lot of you know, big businesses get a lot of their materials from. So they get materials from over there. So we got shirts made up, we got wristbands, we got a couple hats made and just started getting connected with various people throughout, you know, the local Gold's gym. Uh, we traveled over to Washington State University for football games. After that, we'd go to the rec center and just find the people that were in really good shape and say, hey, you want a shirt to rep our brand type thing? And, um, you know, post a picture on social media for us, um, for the shirt type thing. So just r really trying to start a brand from scratch and learn a lot through that process, even though, you know, we didn't end up sticking with it long-term. We had to shut it down at some point due to financial stuff and learned a lot about, you know, not putting a business on a credit card. I learned the hard way, um, you know, got out of that situation, but, uh, you live and you learn and you just... I've always been some someone that takes risks on their self on myself and I, I bet in myself and invest in myself that, you know, I'll be able to do what it takes to be successful long term. So I'm pretty flexible when it comes to to investing on, you know, ideas that I have, you could say. Which is partially why I'm talking to you right now on this YouTube channel. But so now pivoting, you know, fitness, college, all that stuff into more so baseball now and how I got into this and the couch GM specifically. So when I graduated from college in 2016, I joined a fantasy baseball league. One of my friends in college had some buddies throughout high school and another college that he went to throughout California, um, some buddies in this league. And it's a really competitive fantasy uh, baseball league. Uh, 14 teams that we're in have a decent sized buy-in each year. We're called the high rollers and we go to Vegas for the fantasy draft or we go to a certain location. We went to Scottsdale, Arizona last year uh, for the fantasy draft. And uh, so I guess since 2016 is when I got really into, fo uh, you know, focusing on baseball and watching all MLB teams specifically. I had followed the Mariners, you know, throughout my life growing up. I wasn't ever, you know, watching every single game. But, you know, when they were fun to watch, I was watching them pretty consistently. I would go to games when I when I could, you know, maybe one a year, you could say. You know, living a few hours from Seattle, it's not like it's not the easiest thing to do, especially when you're young, you don't have money or a car. But since uh, graduating, I joined that fantasy baseball league, wanted to watch all the teams and um, I got really into it. And whenever I have a fantasy pitcher that's pitching that day, I try to watch their start, you know, to see because if they have a blow up game to where they don't get many points or they give up a ton of runs, you know, via the eye test, are they still, you know, pitching well where they just lit up and the team got lucky one day or are they seriously struggling? Is their velocity down? Like all these different things kind of being a scout, you could say a couch GM. And that's essentially where the name came from was from fantasy sports because, you know, everyone is their own couch GM. If you have a fantasy team, you're managing your team like your own general manager. And so that's kind of where the name came from initially. And that's why I started um, my channel with, you know, filming bullpens essentially, because anytime that I drafted a, a pitcher in fantasy baseball 
or was looking at drafting someone, I wanted to be able to see that pitcher and their pitches that they have and the movement and see how, how dirty of a pitcher they are, you know, to get excited and hyped up about having that pitcher on my team. Now in following the Mariners, you know, when we got Robinson Cano, when we got Nelson Cruz, all these guys, we had some exciting teams. Um, when the sell-off began in 2018, when, you know, Edwin Diaz and Robinson Cano were shipped over to the New York Mets, back came Jared Kelnick and Justin Dunn and um, Jay Bruce. That was when I really started to look at, you know, what was going on and following the prospects that we were having and the team as a whole. And then I forget exactly when Jerry DePoto started doing it or when I started listening to it. But every week on the Jerry Depo um, on the Mike Salk show, Seattle Sports 710, I was listening to the Jerry DePoto show and him talking about the moves that were going on within the Mariners organization. So since about 2018, I've been following the Mariners uh, specifically really closely. And, you know, listening every week to Jerry DePoto, hearing about what was going on with, on with the Mariners, uh, gave a lot of insight and made me really excited for what was to come because I knew the farm system was getting so stacked, you know, especially with that 2020 trade where they sent uh, Austin Nola, Dan Altavia, and one other reliever to the Padres for Ty France, Andres Munoz, Taylor Trammell, Luis Torrens. That trade was just insane. And essentially, I was looking for as much Mariners content and information as I could. You know, there's only really one channel out there on YouTube that talks Mariners, and you could kind of figure out who that is for yourself. But there was just a certain point to where I wasn't really agreeing with opinions that were out there on, online about what the Mariners were doing or various players, their opinions on players. And so eventually, I just decided that I wanted to start my own YouTube channel. Um, back when I started fast fit, you know, I started doing social media stuff. I bought a, I bought a studio type mic back then. Um, so I just decided once the Adam Frazier trade happened in November of 2021, where we traded with Padres to get Adam Frazier, I decided to make a video about that Adam Frazier trade. And that was my first video that I posted. That was in December of 2021. Now, as I mentioned, I've been pretty introverted a lot of my life, but, um, you know, broke out of my shell once I got into sales and, and, and I've always been a big details analytics guy. I try to look behind the scenes and see, you know, why things are happening or like I mentioned, you know, you watch a, a pitcher start and the stats might say one thing, but their actual stuff might say a different thing. You know, they still could have a ton of movement on their pitches with, with the velocity and things look really promising, even though the stat line doesn't exactly show that. Just started putting myself out there with that, you know, Adam Frazier trade, kind of stating my opinion with what, what was going on, kind of showing some stats. Hey, Adam Frazier was just an all-star with the, the Pittsburgh Pirates, traded over to the Padres, and then now he's traded to the Mariners. So we all thought that would be a great pickup, you know, bringing over a second base, an all-star second baseman where we haven't had great production at second base as we all know we all know how the adam frazier experience went with the mariners and then he goes to the orioles and starts tearing it up again but anyways you know when i started my youtube channel i honestly saw other baseball channels out there in general with 200,000 400,000 subscribers and i thought to myself that in you know as humbly as i could say this you know if i just take the time to focus on creating content or creating a video I feel like I can make better videos than those people with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. That's just my honest opinion with looking at the quality of what was already out there. Um, so that's when I decided to just start making videos and, you know, go back and watch my first video or don't because, you know, you will see that it's my first video that I've ever made. But like they say in the Mariners organization and like Eugenio Suarez says, you know, 1%, just give, get 1% get better every day. Uh, you know, get 1% better every video that you make. Just learn one new little editing thing that you can put into a video. Learn how to get, you know, copyright free music to put into your video. Just put in a little more effort each time and that compound effect is a real thing to where, to where you get 1% better every day, you're exponentially better a year from now, you know, X amount of years from now. And so with my channel, I've been focusing on just trying to create content that I myself would want to watch that I'm interested in. You know, this started off as a real, and it still is, you know, a passion project. Um, it's turning into more of a thing to where I'm going to try to figure out how to monetize it more and to grow it to a point to where I want to become one of the, the you know, next big media brands. You know, Couch GM Media is, is one of those 
next big brands that becomes the thing. But, you know, create content that I myself am interested in and that I myself as a baseball fan, as a Mariners fan would want to watch. That's my goal. And at the time, I decided to really niche down. And since I'm, you know, a diehard Mariner fan, I was just going to focus purely on Mariners content. Um, since I saw that there was a big hole there, there was really only one other source of information regarding the Mariners. So I could become my own source, putting out my opinions on that. You know, there's Barstool Sports on the East Coast, which, which is, you know, a bunch of Yankees, Red Sox, that type of that type of fans. Um, John Boy Media is the Yankees, but there wasn't really anyone for the Mariners. So I tried to set out to, to do that myself. And also with it, I didn't want to be, you know, just like a broken record type channel to where someone complaining about the same stuff over and over. I wanted to be someone that was bringing to, to light a different opinion. You know, I myself am a very optimistic person and I try to look at the positive side of things. And so with my videos, I try to do that, you know. And baseball is a game of failure. If you, if you succeed three times out of 10, you're likely an all-star. And especially, you know, being a Mariners fan, as you guys all know, uh, there's ups and downs throughout the season. It's 162 game season. It's six months long. If you are just pessimistic and looking at the negatives, it's going to be a, a long year for you going to be a pretty miserable year so try to try to stay optimistic as much as you can you know you do have to be a realist at times look at the actual facts of things you know for example the front office if things are just going so bad you have to be a realist and make changes at, at some point but the lineup coming into the year was solid and you have to stay optimistic that the players will return to their mean you know the players have been performing worse than expected or worse than their careers up to this point like Colton Wong and AJ Pollock, eventually they had to cut ties with them. But moral of the story is to try to stay optimistic as much as you can. And eventually you'll see some light like we are now with the Mariners. They are on a seven game win streak. They're currently the hottest team in baseball since July as far as the win loss record. They have a top four uh, uh, pitching staff in all of baseball. Their bats are starting to, to turn around. So things are on the up and up. And they made the playoffs last year for the first time in 20 years. So there's that that's off our, their shoulders at least. But back to my videos, I started, you know, filming bullpens. That was one of the things that I started to do, just trying to get a bullpen of each pitcher. Uh, it's really it's really cool in Seattle because you can get right behind the catcher in the bullpen, which is pretty unique to the stadium. Um, I next time I go to other stadiums, I'm gonna try to try to do the same type of thing, filming other players, but I don't know how many stadiums allow you to get right behind uh, the bullpen like you can at the Mariner Stadium. But one of the reasons why I started filming the bullpens is because when I draft a guy in fantasy baseball, you know, I want to see how their stuff looks as, as a hitter. You know, me, myself, growing up playing baseball, I want to see the stuff that this guy has and, be, you know, help me get excited or if it means drafting a guy or not drafting a guy. Um, like seeing you Darvish, you know, hit him throw his bullpens. He's got like eight different pitches at high velocity. It's ridiculous what some of these guys do. So getting those bullpens is pretty cool. Uh, throughout the 2022 season, I just started creating videos on current events as they were happening. Um, cool, unique stats that I saw on Twitter. Shout out Alex Mayer. If you're watching this, he's the uh, big stat guy with the Mariners and the Mariners PR. Go follow Alex Mayer on Twitter because he finds the most unique way out there stats. In August 2022 is when I created my first player profile. It was the big dumper player profile because, I mean, Cal Raleigh, I felt like, was an extremely underrated catcher and player in the league. You know, Adley Rutschman was a rookie last year along with Cal Raleigh. So I felt, felt like Cal was being overshadowed by Adley a lot because, hey, it's another rookie switch hitting young promising catcher and Adley. Um, you know, pretty objectively has the better overall tools or had the better overall overall tools. Uh, you know, he hits for average. He hits for power. He's got great defense. Cal has a lot of those things as well. And he, of course, there was the big dumper nickname that I wanted to utilize and get out there. And, and I wanted to make it a funny but informative video on who Cal is and where he came from. And when I when I made that video, um, that was definitely... I view my videos as being like short films, you could say. It's not a podcast that I have like this right now is a podcast, which is an extended conversation. But my channel as a whole, I feel like they're all short films. It's like a production. You know, it's like a short movie or short film, you could say, to where there's the intro, the hook. It's, you know, informative. It's it's entertaining. There's the production value into it. There's the music. There's all these different things. When I posted that video, it got 3,000 views in the first nine days. And I believe that was the video with the most traction up up to that point as fast as it did 
And I noticed that whenever I saw Cal hit a home run, that view spiked because people were typing in Cal Raleigh home run, and then they would find my big dumper player profile. So that kind of gave me the idea that I wanted to create more videos that were highly searchable. I wanted to start creating more evergreen content to where, you know, it's, it's a video that will perform five years from now if someone searches and finds that player that player's background is not gonna change five years from now. So that video still could be relevant at that point. And also that would help with the long-term goal of you know passive income with videos that I made five years from now, if they're still making money or getting views down the road, then, then great. Next, I made the George Kirby player profile, which was you know painting the edges with that two-seamer. Um, then I did something to where when we traded for Luis Castillo, you know, I covered the trade, but then on a Tuesday, I decided to drive up and see his home debut in Seattle. So I drove up, drove up on a Tuesday for a 7-10 game against the Yankees. I filmed this pregame bullpen. I left in the seventh inning to be able to get home in time to get a, a decent night's sleep. And by the time that I got home, the game was still going on. If you think back to that game, the Mariners ended up winning 1-0 in like the 13th inning. Throughout the rest of the 2022 season, I just kept creating player profiles on guys that you know I thought were interesting. I tried to cover as many of the Mariners players as I could. And then throughout the offseason, you, know, you know, I got Colton Wong, Teoscar Hernandez, all the, the uh, offseason acquisitions, or at least the big names. What was really cool and, and what was a big motivation for me was in early October. So backing up, I didn't start doing short-form content whatsoever until August of 2022. So like, you know, eight, nine months into the channel, I didn't, I didn't do any short-form content. I didn't do anything on Instagram, TikTok, anything like that. In August, I started to repurpose my content. So I would take my player profiles or my longer videos, chop them up into shorts, which are 60 seconds or less in vertical, and then upload it across Instagram reels, TikTok, Facebook reels. Actually, I, I didn't do Facebook reels actually until probably six months ago now, three months ago. But once I did, started doing short form content, I definitely saw an increase in viewership, subscribers, um, just overall traction. So if you're doing YouTube yourself, I highly recommend doing short form content, at least repurposing your long form videos into shorts so that you can post, you know, in between your long form videos, which are going to drive people back to your channel. Um, they're going to try to find whatever video that short came from, right? And then they'll watch that whole thing. And so when I was posting stuff on Instagram Reels, I would tag the players that I made videos on. And uh, one night I was at my parents' house and Andres Munoz followed me on Instagram and he started liking all the videos that I had tagged him in about his player profile. So I DM'd him, I sent a link uh, to his player profile and he got back to me and he said that he watches my videos. He said that they're, they're very good. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, Andres Munoz is watching my stuff and he's like a subscriber. So, I mean, that, that right there is motivation in itself to just keep continuing what I'm doing. Just keep the nose to the grindstone. Don't stop, you know, just double down even and uh, just stick with it. So it turns out Munoz is watching the videos and then I uh, end up going to the playoff game in October. I message him before the game and then I end up meeting him out in the bullpen um, which is really cool. So really cool and fun first year of baseball for me on the YouTube channel. That was 2022. Then throughout the off season in 2022, I was just covering, you know, the various trades that were happening, the players that the Mariners were acquiring, making more player profiles, just trying to create more Mariners content that I thought would be interesting. Then that following off season, um, someone that, someone that I ran hood to coast with hood to coast is down here in the uh, around Mount Hood area to where it's a relay race. Essentially, it's a relay race to where there's typically 12 people on a team, two vans. You start at Mount Hood, and then you start running legs until you get to the coast. One of the people I ran with on the team, he actually works in uh, cable television for various sports. He connected me with someone that's an on-field broadcaster for the Mariners. Um, she told me to DM someone on Twitter that was within me media for the Mariners. So I did so. He eventually got, got back to me. We jumped on a call. I explained who I am, what I'm doing, my YouTube channel, my goals for what I'm looking to do. And at the time, I had made the Bryce Miller player profile pretty recently, talking about you know the next big prospect to come up for the Mariners is Bryce Miller. This was in January at the time. And I uh, jumped on a call. And we kind of talked through it. And he asked if I'd like Bryce Miller to be my first interview on the channel. So I was like, you know, absolutely. So February 20th uh, was when I interviewed Bryce Miller. Uh, they were at spring training and I had 15 minutes with them on zoom. Uh, so, you know, prepped questions, super nervous for this interview, you know, that I hadn't been really nervous at all with anything up to this point for, 
you could say years, I guess. Um, aside from proposing to my wife, that was a pretty uh, nerve wracking thing, uh, even though you know the answer to that one. But but you know, sitting there waiting for Bryce Miller to jump on the Zoom call I had butterflies like crazy. Um, but you know, eventually got over it and had a good conversation. Uh, got the first interview out of the way. Followed up a couple weeks later, then was able to get Taylor Dollard on the channel, who's another Mariners pitching prospect. That was March 13th, 2023. Um, that was the second interview. I wanted to interview other pitchers specifically, um, you know, Kirby Gilbert. I wanted to get Wu on the channel, um, mainly because, you know, I was a pitcher growing up and I still actually play adult league baseball and I pitch and play outfield. And so I can understand from a pitcher's mindset, you know, shaping a pitch um, you know, wear and tear on their arm, going through their routine mindset of a pitcher going against a hitter, all these different things. I feel like I could just have a more in-depth conversation with a pitcher compared to a hitter, because I mean, as a hitter, it's, you know, see ball and react, you know, there's pretty reactionary, but as a pitcher, I feel like you're thinking a lot more compared to hitting. Cause if you're thinking a lot in the box, then you're probably going to be striking out or thinking too much and just get yourself all tied up. But if you're a pitcher, you're 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 going to be thinking more so. I I feel like after that interview, I uh, actually went down to Scottsdale for my fantasy baseball draft in March, and I went to the Mariners uh, complex for one day. I uh, was able to. I met Taylor Dollar in person at that point. You know, he was throwing a bullpen. I caught up with him. Said, "Hey, hey, what's up?" It was funny. I saw Felney and Celestine um, walking from field to field and we've interacted over Instagram, but you know, the language barrier wasn't, or was there. So it was tough. I just gave him a fist bump and you know, we we're on our way, but hoping next year to get down for spring training more to be able to interview more, more players. We'll see how things go. But then I also decided to start making, you know, videos on some of the top college players. So Chase Dolander was the first college player that I decided to make a video on. He was heading into the season, um, the top uh, pitching prospects coming out of college until, of course, Paul Skeens just blew everyone away. I then made a video on Dylan Cruz and then on Paul Skeens after that. And I noticed that on the player profile, I kind of mentioned this before, but the searchability of these videos, um, you know, I made a video on Mitch Hanniger uh, during the offseason before he signed with the Giants. Then once he signed with the Giants, I, you know, changed the thumbnail on the, his player profile to a Giants background, him in a Giants jersey. Now I've got a player, now I've got fans of the San Francisco Giants that are watching my channel or watching that video at least. So I'm really excited to see where things go with the player profile series. You know, I, I hate, hate to see people move from team to team, but as that happens, then, you know, with that, without me really having to do anything, I just change the thumbnail. I now have viewers from another team that are watching and potentially following me at that point. Then it was around May where I reached back out to my media connection and uh, he had mentioned potentially getting some big leaguers on the channel for interviews. Things were tight as far as, you know, time availability, uh, mainly big media was getting the interviews, but he said that I could, you know, get media credentialed. So that means that, you know, whichever game I want to go to, I can apply, I can apply for credentials and then that team can, if they have space for me up in the press box, essentially, then they can approve my credentials for that weekend. So, so since May, I've been going up to Seattle essentially for every series that the Mariners have been in town, just trying to get, um, you know, player interviews on the sidelines. So that's been a lot of fun being able to be on the sidelines during batting practice. You know, a lot of the people that I've been talking to are the relievers just because of the timing of everything. You know, the infielders come out and do their thing. They're playing catch. There's not much time to get them. And I kind of stand down the sideline a bit not right next to the dugout, just to kind of give them a little breathing room. Um, I, I could set up shop right next to the dugout and try to get some of the position players more so. Um, I've, I've got some outfielders. I've gotten Kelnick. I've gotten Julio once. Um, I want to get Cade Marlowe soon, but I've talked to pretty much all of the pitchers out there because they're out in right field. They walk right by me, and they've all been super nice, seem like great guys. And uh, yeah, just going to keep showing my face up there, see what opportunities come with it. My goal for the channel moving forward is to hopefully get uh, big leaguers this off season. That's my big goal is to get, you know, current Mariners players and other players throughout the league through the people that I get, get connected with and just keep doing a weekly podcast. That's my goal. One podcast a week. And it's been really cool so far. Some of the people that I've been able to meet and get on the channel, you know, Mark Lowe, he lives locally. So I had him on the channel. How I got connected to him is he ended up buying the batting cage that my adult league was practicing in the off season. 
I reached out to the prior owner, you know, trying to do a podcast, my first podcast with John Sukanik, uh, the guy who plays catch every day. I wanted to do that first podcast in the batting cages, but it was bought by Mark. So connected with Mark, kind of introduced myself, what I'm doing, got him on the podcast. And that, now that's been a cool connection. So, and now I got, you know, Tom Lampkin coming on the channel next week. Who's a 13 year big leaguer. Um, again, he played for the Mariners in 2001 when they won 116 games, you know, had the all-star game there. And, you know, I have these first few guys on, I can only imagine where it's going to be, you know, a year from now, if I just stay consistent with it and keep just introducing myself, people see kind of who I am, um, what I'm doing and that want to align with, you know, what, what I'm doing. So it's been really exciting. It's been a lot of fun. I'm going to be looking to take it to the next level coming up soon. I'm going to start, you know, selling more merchandise, you know, shirts, hats, all that type of stuff, maybe golf balls, some stickers. Uh, I'm going to start doing potentially some premium subscriptions to where maybe I'll do like a subscriber only type live, you know, in a separate, on a separate page type thing. We'll see just a few milestones for my YouTube channel. So it took me seven months to get to 250 subscribers. So July of 2022 is when I got to 250 subscribers in August is when I started uploading shorts, TikTok, and Instagram. Um, by the time I was at nine months, I got to 500 subscribers. So I doubled in two months after taking, you know, seven months to get to 250. Uh, by the time I was at 10 months, I got to a thousand subscribers. So I doubled in a month. Then I doubled again to 2000 subscribers in four months. I added another thousand in three months after that. So 3000 subscribers in 17 months. I then passed a million views back in July of this year, which was 19 months. And then I just passed 4,000 subscribers in August, uh, which took 20 months to everyone that's still watching. I really appreciate your support and I'm really excited to see where things are at a year from now. It's been a fun journey so far, but I'm excited to see what the next steps are. So feel free to comment below any questions additional that you have any comments. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.